the following interview was conducted with Professor Channing B. Blickenstaff, Professor Emeritus for of Foreign Languages and Literature for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, March 23, 2009 at his residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. All right. Uh, I was born actually in home hospital in Lafayette, but my parents were living in Rossville, Indiana, not too far away, to the east, uh, in 1934, uh, October the 8th. And uh, I have one older brother who was born in 1929. His name is Bradley. Uh, <clears throat> my father was a banker in Rossville and uh, was transferred then to the main branch of the Clinton County Bank and Trust Company in Frankfort. So I, I grew up in Frankfort, Indiana. I went to high school there, graduated. I met my wife, Janet, there. Tell us a little about high school, were the activities and how large a school and class? Uh, it's a kind of a medium-sized high school. Frankfort had one high school. It's a city that was about 12,000 residents at that time. And I think there were 100, 143 in my graduating class. So it was a Nice size, not too big, not too small, high school. Uh, Any <clears throat> clubs that you joined? Or you uh, I was in, uh, one of the main clubs was Hi Y at that time. It was uh, a club everybody, all the boys wanted to be in, um, <laughs> at least. Uh, what sort of club was that? It, it was a, a, a kind of, uh, it was a social club primarily, but it, it was intended to enhance uh, virtuous living, that kind of thing. Sure. <laughs> and uh, they have almost events in the order. there were dances and uh, sometimes service activities. Uh, uh, we also cooperated. Uh, we had a math teacher who uh, was involved with uh, recycling, and uh, hmm. we would go around and, and pick up uh, waste paper and, of course, old newspapers, everything that could possibly be recycled. We even had a machine that compressed uh, waste paper, uh, office paper. Uh, and, uh, you had your own little business. We right? had our little business there. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that, that was actually the math club, I think, that did that. But Hi-Y participated in sure. that, too. And uh, it was kind of a matter of togetherness at that point. Uh -huh. I was also in the, um, the band and orchestra. I, uh, and I, my father was uh, very good to me in, in, uh, in providing uh, music lessons for me, both on the piano and the, and the trumpet. And uh, he was, uh, he found out about a, a person in Indianapolis who uh, taught how to play the piano by ear, more or less, using chord symbols and improvising, which was a new thing at that time. It's become much more prevalent now. Uh, so <clears throat> for several weeks during one summer, I traveled to Indianapolis where there were two or three other uh, boys in town, uh, I think one girl too, that uh, we would travel down, one of the parents would take us down uh, on a Saturday and we'd have our lessons and then come back, so mm -hmm. uh, that was an activity that was a little bit out of the ordinary, mm -hmm. but the band and orchestra was a very important part of my, my life in, in high school. And, uh, Did I, you play I was, at athletic events? And <laughs> yes, we, we would play at the football games and basketball games primarily. Um, I was also in a little dance band, uh, uh, the, the swing band. Uh, <laughs> big band era, and there was a, a high school musical, of course, <laughs> called the Big Broadcast. A lot of activities going yeah, on. A lot Sounds of activities. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It was called the Big Broadcast, named after a movie. But that name came out, I think, about 1938 or so. I recognize the title. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. But this, uh, <clears throat> I was in. The, I started. Uh, I was in the class of 1952. I graduated, and then uh, from then uh, came came to Purdue. Uh, how'd you have? Did you select Purdue, or how'd that come about? <laughs> well. Uh, at the time, I, th I, w I was interested in engineering, uh, but uh, once I really looked into it, uh, I switched my preference for major to, to economics. Uh, I do have interest in engineering kinds of things, but not to the extent of becoming an engineer, I found out. <clears throat> I had all the prerequisites, all the math and science and everything needed, but uh, I chose economics instead. Uh, Purdue had a a very strong economics department at that time. Uh, the, the nucleus of the Cranert School, which was sure. then established in, I think, after, about the year after I graduated, 1957, I believe. Um, and my, my dad, as I say, was, a, as I said before, was a banker, a businessman. He had other interests besides the banking, too. 
And uh, he encouraged me to do that just as a kind of general thing in case, you know. <laughs> so I, I did that. Did you live on campus? Uh, I, I did. I didn't live in a residence hall, though. I lived right next to, to campus on Andrew Place Street at, uh, in, a, in a private residence there. Um, uh, it was the Wilson's home, and they had their upstairs re uh, modeled for uh, students. There were four of us, two in one room and then two, two in one double room, and then there were two single rooms down the hall. So I did live with, with three other mm -hmm. Purdue students, a little bit like dormitory living, but uh, <laughs> more restricted in that sense. Sure. We, we would have to come in through their living room up the stairs, you know, <laughs> so they could keep track of it. <laughs> it wasn't an outside stair. <laughs> so it was kind of in local parentis, actually. <laughs> yeah, it sounds a little bit like that. What about meals? Did you have to, you, could you do a uh, we, we just, uh, no, we just ate at restaurants. Oh, you uh, didn't, there was, they, sometimes yeah. those apartments, yeah. they got a little kitchen or something uh, like that. These didn't, but there were, there were more restaurants there. Of course, there was uh, the union, Purdue Union, we could always go there, but there were lots of little private restaurants around. There was a really good cafeteria. Yeah. Uh, near, I've heard nearby. that there was one yeah. in town. Okay. Yeah, and there were other little hole-in-the-wall kinds of restaurants. We would go to all of them at one time or another, and they were cheap. <laughs> Didn't have to <coughs> spend a lot of money. Uh, but we got by that way. We watched it. We made sure we had good, sure. uh, balanced meals, so we did a pretty good job. And uh, so that was uh, my, my experience there. The um, My first... <laughs> I, I tried out for the band right away, but even before classes started. At, at that time, they had a couple of orientation systems. I, I was involved in a in a, a kind of special freshman orientation uh, for it was called a leadership academy or something like that. Uh, I, I remember Dean Mallet uh, spoke. He was the dean of men. He was dean of men at that time, and it was out at Ross Camp. It was a week before. Even the orientation week. And orientation week was a week before our classes started. But during that orientation week then, I, so I'd already been on campus a week, uh, it was time for band tryouts. Spots Emmerich was the band director at that time. And uh, he had a unique system of trying out members for the band. He would go into his office and, you know, the band department's in the back of the music hall. And uh, you'd go up the back entrance there, up the steps, and up a little farther, and there, the hallway splits in two directions, to the right and to the left. Well, his office was on the right, and there was a library for music, band music, on the left. So he said, well, you go in that library there and just toot around here. Here's some things I want you to play for me. Just practice them a little bit, and I'll be in my office, and, and, uh, and when, when you think you're ready, uh, I'll come in, and, and we'll, we'll have the audition. <laughs> But of course, he could hear everything I was doing. <laughs> so I was, but, but I was more relaxed that way, you know. But uh, <laughs> it was interesting. It was a wonderful way to do it. He did so, it one on one. He did so one audition. on one, absolutely one on one. And, and uh, this was in the evening. He would have everybody come in in the evening, different times. And a uh, little bit, he came in and said, "Well, I think Blick and Stab, I think you're you're going to make the band, all right." <laughs> no, no more said, you know. Well, I ended up with second chair, <laughs> which was pretty good for a freshman in the, in the, symphonic, <laughs> so. in the symphonic band. Uh, so uh, I was pleased with that. And uh, Let me ask you, did they just, what bands did they have? Just a marching band and a symphonic band? They had band? the marching band and the symphonic band okay. at that time. But No, they also had a pep well, The Glee band. Club existed, though, at that the, time. Yeah, the Glee Club. Okay. They had a pep band. So those oh. were the three bands. The pep band played at basketball games. Those were the three bands in the band department. Then, then PMO, Purdue Musical Organizations, right, okay. had the Glee Club, and uh, they also sponsored the Purdue Orchestra at that time. Hmm. Now, since then, uh, several years, well, many years ago now, <laughs> the orchestra uh, was transferred over to the band department. So we have now instrumental music with band and orchestra under the band department and uh, choral music under PMO. And of course, they've expanded their group, Glee Club, Purdue Eds. <clears throat> they even have something now called the Campus Chorale, which is for not just students, but anybody sure. who, who wants to, right. to join. Um, what was Spot, Spots Emmerich like? Spots Emmerich was, was See, quite yeah, a he's character. He's long gone, and yeah. this will, researchers will be interested yeah, he, in he, he was He was a character and uh, the, the kind of a person that you remember things he said. I still remember several things that he said. Uh, 
clear back in 1952, 53, 54, when I was in, in the band. Uh, but, uh, well, one thing that he said uh, that I've always remembered is, if you're going to make a mistake, make a hell of a big one. <laughs> so Go all the way, right? Yeah, don't be bashful. He says, we had a bass drummer once who <coughs> hit the bass drum in exactly the wrong place where nobody was playing, wasn't supposed to be there at all. The audience loved it. They thought it was exactly the right thing to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> uh, so he was that kind of person. And very inspiring. He was an electrical engineer, actually, by training. He had no music, formal musical training <laughs> whatsoever. But he was a natural musician and loved music and uh, a natural leader. And that's what it took at that time. Sure. And innovator. He was a, you know, the block P, uh, <clears throat> breaking out of formation and making a... Um, a letter on the field, that was his, his That's idea. Right. And, uh, right. it was what, what did the symphonic, you were in that, what sort of concerts did you people give? Uh, we didn't go very far afield. Okay. Uh, we did go over to Illinois. I remember my first fall, we went to a concert, I think uh, Mattoon, Illinois, maybe mm -hmm. it was. Uh, uh, we went around the state somewhat, other, other cities not too far away. And then you had concerts here on campus, too? Yeah, we had oh. lots of concerts on campus. We were, of course, at the Indianapolis 500 every, every year with the marching band, but uh, uh, the uh, symphonic band also played at commencement, and uh, that, that was an important part. We, we gave a Mother's Day concert every year in the, in the music hall, right. so just playing in the music hall stage was a, <laughs> was a thrill. Yeah. I also, also remember my, one of my very first times in, in the marching band, uh, walking into the rehearsal hall, <coughs> and we had uh, we had name tags on at that time, so we get to know each other. And I noticed somebody by the name of Armstrong. Well, I lived on Armstrong Street in Frankfurt, so I went up to this guy. He was kind of an imposing. He was older, and then, you know I could tell he was an upper classman, and. Uh, I went up to him and said, hey, you know, I live on Arm Armstrong Street. Maybe it's named after you. Ha, ha, ha. Well, of course, it was Neil Armstrong. <laughs> How about that? Little did either one of us know that <laughs> Neil Armstrong would eventually become uh, the person who had lots of things named after him, not so just So he was street. in the band the same time He was in the band the same time I was, yeah. Interesting. Uh, little interesting sidelight there, but uh, he, he was. And was he in your class? He, he, he was a senior at that oh, okay. time, and I was okay. a freshman. That was his last year. Oh, okay. What? Did he? Uh, what did he played uh, baritone, uh, so uh, he wasn't in the symphonic band, but he was he was in the, uh, marching, the marching band. band you right, know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but that that was a that was a nice activity. It, it, it was a, it was a great activity, and then I was also in a uh, another big band. Uh, it, uh, we played at dances. It, it, it Purdue. It was Chet Bausch was the was the leader of that band, and we had I think sixteen piece orchestra, and we would play at proms for high schools and around. And you had the military uh, bands too, probably. Yeah, bands. yeah, <laughs> that, that's right. We did. Um, of course, the Purdue band, marching band at that time, was a military band too. Uh, right, that's and, what I've learned. And it, yeah, and it got it. it it, it uh, satisfied the ROTC requirement, which was in place at that. All the men students had to either go to ROTC or band, <laughs> one or the other, of course, most of them were ROTC. But uh, <clears throat> my being in the band uh, exempted me from ROTC. So then when I was eventually drafted into the service, uh, and I was, <laughs> uh, the year after I graduated, actually the fall of, of 1956, uh, I was an enlisted man instead of an officer. <laughs> but that was all right. I was a clerk typist, and I was... Uh, after basic training, I was sent to Korea, and uh, lo and behold, uh, there was a chance. Uh, I, I was the battalion commander's uh, secretary in a way, you might put it put it that way, assistant uh, in the office. Uh, and one of the uh, sidelines there, one of the volunteer hobby kinds of activities after hours was uh, to sing in a, in a choir. They were trying to get a little choir going, and uh, we had oh eight or ten people, um, who, uh, soldiers who signed up for it, so I had more musical training than most of them, so I ended up as directing <laughs> a little choir, well, which was my first experience really with uh, having anything to do in an active way. I'd been in church choirs and, and that kind of thing too, sure. but, uh, but this, this was another 
Oh, Music right. is intertwined all the way through 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 my life. Sounds good, <laughs> and still is. It still is, absolutely yes. Uh, but the the four years uh, at, at Purdue were, uh, of course, as everybody will tell you, and as you know, are uh, probably the most uh, influential and uh, most important in, in in anyone's life. Those undergraduate years, I think your character is really solidified there, and. Uh, President Hubdy was was uh, had been president, I think, for. He came in forty six. He came in forty six. He'd been president for six years. It was uh, just at the end of the really big influx of the veterans coming back. Uh, now my brother Brad started in nineteen forty seven, and that was at the height of the of the in, yeah, influx so of veterans. Yeah, I've learned, yeah. Um, people that were here at that. Time. And there were still quite a few left at the <clears> time that I, on the GI Bill when I got there, but they were beginning to thin out somewhat. Of course, we had the Quonset huts, which <laughs> have now finally been replaced by. Finally, after all <laughs> yeah. these years, you know. Uh, <clears throat> the black and whites things. Uh, they were down housing on State for, Street. Yeah, you know, State Street for faculty were still there. Sure. Uh, was the varsity apartment there at that time? Yes, it was still there. You said you lived on Andrews. So I was going to ask yeah, you. It was right, in the, right on the corner. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Um, a couple of my professors that I had uh, lived there. Um, one of my Spanish in instructors lived lived in the varsity apartments. And later on in graduate school, uh, one of the uh, psychology professors in statistics lived in, mm -hmm. the, in the varsity apartments, Ben Weiner. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> So oh, the, everything has changed so much, but <laughs> but the, the, the Purdue spirit, I think, <laughs> is, is is still there. And uh, and a lot of the activities you were talking about, the union playing there, a lot of the activities revolved. Things were at the union, they, 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 dances, they, they and it all that was the social hub. It, it was the, the social <laughs> hub, and uh, I, I think campus was well about uh, twelve. It was about twelve thousand when I was there. What is it now? Thirty. 39-something. So now. it's more than three times. Um, anyway, it's, it's, it's grown so much that I, I don't know whether the atmosphere is anyways near what it was. Of course, it was still a big school, even, even right. with 12,000, but, but there was still... A little I bit think, of smallness on the other side of it, I see what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, for example, the Team spirit, you know, everybody went to the football games, everybody went to the basketball games. And that was in, the basketball would have been in, in, uh, in, Lambert. in the old, in the Lambert Field House. Right. And of course, uh, Ross A. Stadium was still Ross A. Stadium, but it wasn't anything like it is now. Sure. It's expanded an awful lot since yeah. then. And then playing in the band at the, at the, at the football games was. Uh, what did you think the first time you walked in that stadium? That was a big. That, even then, the stadium was a pretty good size. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought it was a great thing. I had been there um, uh, since we lived in Frankfurt. Um, my parents were big Purdue fans right from the start, so they brought me over to some some, some games, games. Okay. and to the Victory Varieties in the music hall. I remember those. Yeah, those were yeah. great. I got to Saturday see, and Sunday, or no, Friday yes. and Saturday, two shows. Yeah, I, that's right, and and I got to see. Uh, like Bob Hope. <laughs> I know. I remember. Uh, it, it was it was really a tremendous thing. Because even when my brother and sister in law would come for some games, and we would go mm -hmm. either one or the other night, and it yeah. was the yeah. tickets were very reasonable, and it was yeah. it was great. It really was. My parents went to these the victory the football game and then the victory varieties afterwards. Sure. It was a, a great because in those great days night. most of the games were. <laughs> They're all at one thirty. Kick off precisely at one thirty. You knew exactly when they were going to be. <laughs> no, no problem there at all. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, well, I don't know the the whole uh, experience, the, uh, the the Purdue spirit, of, like the, the seriousness, and, and yet the camaraderie and and having a good time weren't in. Compatible. No, and all, it all worked, uh, yeah, all blended in yeah, together. Yeah, all blended in together, and right. I think there's still a, a Purdue spirit that, oh, yeah. that that comes into play there. But uh, after my my service in the, in the military, were you married at that time? I I, I got married just before uh, I went into the service. Uh, after you my, my high school did, sweetheart. Yeah. Was, uh, did she come to Purdue? <laughs> she did eventually. Uh, oh. She was a year behind me in school, and she went to Stevens College. In um, Missouri. In, in Missouri. Uh, so for my 
sophomore and junior year, she was in Stevens, but she came back to Purdue then and graduated from mm -hmm. Purdue. Because Stevens at that time was a junior college. It was a junior college, just two years. So she finished up at, at Purdue, and uh, we were married in the in December before I was shipped off to Korea in January. <laughs> she was a, a senior at Purdue at that time. Sure. I was in basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Uh, so I went overseas as a married <laughs> soldier. And uh, when I got home... Um, How long were you, got, were you in for two years? I, I was uh, 16 months, actually. Um, the basic training was, was two months and then 16 months overseas. Um, I only had three months to go when I um, got, got back in June of 1958, back to the States. And if you had less than three months, three months or less, you were discharged. So I got out three months early because of that. I, for one year, I worked for my, uh, my wife's father, uh, who was a dairyman in Frankfurt, mm -hmm. uh, kind of to get my bearings and see what I wanted to do, maybe use my economics background. But I, I decided pretty quickly that I wasn't a businessman. <laughs> I was more of an academician and a musician. And so I decided uh, my favorite subject had been Spanish, even as an undergraduate. Uh, I hadn't even taken Spanish in high school. I took Latin instead. That was that was a good preparation. That's a good yeah basic yeah, good, thing. Good basic thing. For to term do. etymology. Yeah. yeah. So I came back uh, to graduate school. Decided I wanted to be a Spanish teacher, and uh, so I embarked on that Here at Peru? Career, career change. And uh, <clears throat> it was again a re very rewarding experience just to be back at Purdue. Where did you live when you came then? Uh, we lived in Mary Student Courts. By that time, they had been built. They were they were new. Uh, uh, they replaced a lot of the old. Uh, were some black and whites in there yeah, too as well? Yeah, so they were both yeah, across. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. well, good. And uh, so we lived in newly newly constructed apartments. We thought we were really <laughs> in <yeah>. good shape. <laughs> and it, it was fun. We lived there a couple of years. Uh, but at that time, uh, it was the, the baby boomers were beginning to, to come to, to Purdue. And I was a member of that generation that was rather few in numbers, the, the 30s generation, the Depression kids. So very, very fortunate <laughs> that Purdue needed people to teach these baby boomers coming on and sure. rolling in record numbers on campus. Purdue was growing at an alarming rate. So even with, without having quite finished my master's degree, uh, I must have impressed somebody <laughs> in the department because I was hired and at that time the foreign language department was called the Department of, of uh, Modern Languages as you pointed out at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Where were they located? In, 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 in Purdue Hall? Hall, which isn't there anymore. Okay. It was a residence hall it converted to classrooms. Oh, it was already in the vicinity where it was. It's where the math science were, yeah, building is now. Near University yeah. Hall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but uh, I, I was I was hired um, to, to teach these uh, large numbers of incoming freshmen beginning Spanish, and I finished up my master's degree that same year. Uh, this was, I, I believe, 1960, 61. Um, I had done student teaching already at West Lafayette High School, uh, and I attended a, one of the NDEA institutes, the National Defense Education Act institutes, which had just been in, uh, implemented the, the previous year. Uh, this was after Sputnik. Uh, which Those was were what, pretty good. Others yeah. have made a match, uh, who were yeah. able to take advantage of yeah. that. No, not <clears throat> 1957, I think Sputnik and I think 58 was the <laughs> National Defense Education Act. Uh, 59 and 60 uh, was when they, uh, they began to do summer institutes. So 1960, because of my having attended the summer institute, and it was on the Purdue campus, Purdue was uh, fortunate to, to get one of those. Um, <clears throat> uh, that much of a credential was enough to get me on the Purdue faculty at that time. <laughs> and, but the re again, the reason I chose Purdue wasn't just because it was convenient. Uh, Purdue was actually a leader in foreign language teaching. It was the teaching aspect of language I wanted to emphasize, not the lit literary. And this was Purdue's specialty. The, the department head at that time, Elton Hawking, uh, was one of the top national leaders in teaching languages in the, what was then the new modern method of 
emphasizing speaking and listening rather than reading and writing. Uh, the old approach was grammar translation, you know, all bookish. And uh, the new approach, audio lingual, was you listen and you hear and you speak. And you so then he understand. must have influenced, that's the reason when the language labs came That's right, and he, he had, I think, the first college language lab in the country, at least one of the first. Sure. And it was in Purdue Hall. And so this, Purdue was the go-to place for, for studying for how to teach language. Um, so there, there I was. Um, I went ahead with my PhD. The education department had a good PhD program. Here, also at Purdue? Here, yes, at Purdue, in conjunction with other areas uh, in the sciences and languages and whatever else. At that time, actually when I started at Purdue, the humanities uh, were a part of the science school. And uh, uh, Felix Haas was, was dean of the school <laughs> when I started out and uh, he uh, of, of course while I was there even it became science education and humanities so they began to at least talk about education and humanities and then later on after I became a faculty member science was split off and became humanities social science and education and Bladen Ogle became the dean so I was I went through all of those <laughs> those phases phases either as a student or as a faculty uh, as a faculty member. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I did complete my PhD in uh, in 1964. It was actually awarded January 1965, and uh, was promoted to assistant professor automatically at that time. I had been an instructor. Uh, Purdue. The language department did not have a graduate program when I started as such. Uh, the education department handled my actual academic uh, credentials, but the coursework and the lang all the language aspects were, were there and were quite well done in the, in the foreign language department. Of course, while I was even working as a graduate student myself, uh, uh, Don Walther was instrumental in getting the, de the foreign language department graduate programs established and approved by the graduate school. So by the time I got my PhD, we did have a grad we had a master's program, eventually even a PhD program in foreign languages as such, rather than just with the education department. So uh, <clears throat> I also should point out that uh, it, it was in the late 50s, early 1960s, particularly with the advent of uh, Blade and Ogle and, and, and the school being split off and having its own something in its own right, <clears throat> along with education, that um, that um, the humanities began to really be recognized on campus. Before they were just a service thing, you know, the engineers and the ag people took their courses. Being the land yeah, grant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, they began to become um, established in their own right, and uh, particularly with the advent of, of, of uh, graduate programs. And I, I remember a, a remark that one of the people in conferences, uh, the conferences division uh, of the university, made to me once when I was arranging for some, some kind of conference or something for one of our uh, language programs. Um, I think I was probably assistant department head by that time. He said, you know, I can really see what's happening here with the humanities. Before everything, all the conferences were ag or they were engineering. Now they said, we're getting more and more in humanities. And they're outstripping the other areas. So this was about 1965, 66, <laughs> long and there's something. Uh, so uh, th they did come along there and, and think. Where did you, uh, they, then they tore down Purdue Hall. Is that when you moved to Stanley Holder? That's when we moved to Stanley Holder. In okay. fact, Stanley Holder was remodeled, entirely remodeled. It used to be the biology oh, okay. <laughs> building. Uh, that's where I took biology, in fact. And then the biology annex, as it was called, next door. Uh, <clears throat> but um, it was changed uh, to, over to accommodate, and this was one of Elton Hawking's accomplishments, with a beautifully appointed new language lab, a, a double room uh, with the latest electronic equipment. At that time, it was, of course, all tape recording, sure. magnetic tape recording. But he had individual booths set up. Each, each student could, uh, voice could be recorded on a multi-channel recording machine <coughs> and monitored from the front of the room by the professor by flipping a switch. So he, the professor could listen in on each individual booth in that room and then record the student 
<clears throat> and then play back to that student what he had played. Well, of course, you can do the same thing with individual recorders. And, but, but this was, this was <laughs> something that the, the in professor the, Put in the context of those days, that's pretty it was, high it tech. Was, it was high tech, and it was all controlled by the, by the professor so that he could really uh, see what was going on audiolingually <laughs> with the student. Well, since then, uh, philosophies of teaching languages have changed. The technologies have changed so much that... Uh, those labs now have been converted to computer labs. <laughs> but one interesting thing about this, uh, soon after I finished my degree and became assistant department head, uh, that time Don Walther had become head, and we were trying to get ways beyond the language lab for students to uh, have an easier way of listening to the language tapes. Now, they could always go to the audiovisual center in, in Stewart. Yeah, with Dave Moses. Yeah, with Dave Moses. Did some of them could oh they did that yeah okay. uh, they did that, that gave you probably more space uh, access points yeah but we thought if we could just get something in the dorm so they didn't even you know they could write in their room well uh, this was where Ron Fruitt uh, uh, came into the picture he was a guy just about my age and uh, he was in charge of one of the residence halls I forget which one it, it is now, but one of the new high-rise residence halls I believe it, 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 it was new at that time and uh, he, uh, very cooperative, uh, allowed us to use their in-house closed, not closed circuit as that, but closed loop radio system. They, they had a radio, a little radio station in the residence halls, and there was, a student would put a, a little loop on his radio and it would be broadcast. I think it was through the, probably through the electrical system of the building some way, it was broadcast, and they could tune into the radio and listen to whatever was, was broadcast. Well, he allowed us to broadcast language tapes on a, on a continuing loop, it would get to the end and then repeat. You know, nobody had to do anything with it. And it came from our, uh, from Stanley Holder Hall, <laughs> by wire some way over to his residence hall, and then the students could tune in and listen to it. Well, that that was, again, high tech for the time. And <laughs> now it wouldn't be all. Uh, they could probably do the same the thing on the internet. It, and they didn't have to leave their room. <laughs> they had to leave their room at all. Of course, now with iPods and downloading, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> even better. But uh, right. but still, at the time, it was it was it was a pretty neat thing to Saved do. Saved a lot of steps. Yeah, that, that's right. So those were uh, again the uh, changing technology and and, uh, and the, the curriculum and the programs change as a result of that. Yeah. When was the then? Tell me one thing about how did the department names change? Okay, uh, this this came about. As a result of uh, originally it was called Department of Modern uh, Languages. Modern Languages, and, and the we only foreign languages yeah, came next. Yeah, we, we only the, the Modern Language Department at that time was French, German, Spanish, and Russian. Just those four languages. Uh, the <laughs> one of the legends of Purdue is that John Purdue forbade Latin to be taught at Purdue. Of course, that's nonsense. <laughs> there was nothing in the John Purdue's will about Latin or anything of that type. But uh, that would made a good story. But Purdue did not teach Latin at that time, uh, just because what, it was did no, they teach no Greek. Pardon? Greek, eat, no Greek. No Greek, no, nothing of that kind. Strictly no, no, modern. no classical languages. Yeah, okay. strictly modern languages. <clears throat> and after the development of the humanities and the language department under Don Walther, uh, we began to add more languages. Certainly, we added Italian and Portuguese. Uh, um, and, and then finally, Latin, called classics. <laughs> uh, so, and we also began, we, we were much more involved with literature than we had been. We, we tried to keep the language, as, the language teaching aspect strong, and even foreign languages in the elementary school, a, a program of that, uh, teaching people to do that, mm -hmm. uh, how, how to instigate programs of that sort. sort. Uh, we, we tried to, we didn't have as much luck with that as we'd hoped, but we at least tried to do that. We wanted to keep those strong, but to, to compete with, for good faculty with other universities, you needed to have a strong literature program. And we were beginning to get that <clears throat> by, I think it was probably the late 1970s, uh, we were. We thought we were ready. We had graduate programs in place, and modern languages didn't fit. And we, we had Latin. That's not a modern language, <laughs> uh, and literature was such an important point. So there was a great debate just what to call it. Um, we finally ended up with foreign languages and literatures in the plural, <laughs> foreign languages and literatures. 
Uh, some objected to that foreign language. Well, <laughs> you know, it doesn't sound quite, <laughs> quite right either. But uh, it was the best we could do. It was the most descriptive. That's what we were. Of course, English was the other department that, that taught languages. Right. So, uh, foreign. Was, was it at that time that you expanded? Started you expand more languages? Yes. Yes, okay. we did. Uh, after after I was no longer active in the department, went to the graduate school as an administrator there. We. Uh, Oh, we you know we added uh, Chinese and right. I think Asian Arabic, language. A Asian, yeah, uh, and they became more important mm -hmm. in some respects. And um, enrollments in those languages are, are, are very strong. So. You mentioned earlier about the NDEA that affected mm -hmm. probably enrollment with those institutes because there's a lot. It wasn't that languages was one of the. It was one of the three. Were, yeah, I think uh, science, right. mathematics, and, and foreign language. Right. Yeah. Uh, were, were the three. It was one. Of, it was the first time anything in the humanities had ever <laughs> got so much attention. Sure, right. <laughs> uh, but that was a great boon. But one kind of negative, uh, unforeseen uh, result of that was there were a lot of a lot of students trained under the NDEA in, the, in languages in, in languages with doctoral degrees that by the time they become el became eligible to teach in the 1980s, particularly the Enrollments in of students had dropped somewhat. There weren't as many students to teach, and there were many, many more of them than could wow. be absorbed. Mm. And they could not find jobs, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they had to be often to be retrained. We even had programs to help them find jobs in other fields uh, in business. Be somewhat or, compatible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The University well, of Illinois had a program that people came to from all over the Big Ten to, sure. to go to. What were some of your duties? As how long were you assistant head? I was assistant head from uh, 1964, I believe it was, mm -hmm. until uh, 1971, I believe. Okay. Um, and is and that I, when you then you were going to talk about the grad school? Or? Actually, I had um, a year. I had two years as assistant dean in the humanity in HSSE. Uh, where were they located at that time? What building would they have been in? It was Stanicolder. They were also, okay. Yeah, they were okay. in one end of the building. <laughs> the foreign language offices were the, the head and the secretarial offices were in the west end of the building and okay. HSSC okay. and the counseling offices. I'd forgotten just exactly where, where, in, where, where they were in, located. Were in Stanley Colder. <clears throat> but um, I, I, w I had been langu I, language lab director for a, a couple of years mm -hmm. a, when I was still working on my degree. And then I, after I finished my PhD, I became uh, assistant department head. And I th so it was about, what would that be, about uh, seven, eight years. Okay. Um, and then from uh, from HSSE, assistant dean there, uh, I was I worked for uh, Fred Andrews in, in the graduate school as was assistant dean. Was he the dean. head of grad school at that he, time? He was, uh, yes, vice president for research and, and uh, Dean of the Graduate School. That, those, that was a combined position at sure. that time. Uh, another great man, uh, Phil Haas, Fred Andrews, uh, of course, President Hubdy, President Hansen, President Beering. I <laughs> sure. worked with some really, really great people, uh, Hawking and, and uh, Walther, my department heads. Um, they're just uh, unsurpassed. What were some of your duties that were now were you permanently there? Was there? You still had your association with the foreign languages? And languages. Yes. Uh, of course, as assistant department head, I mainly helped the department head on sure. the re recruiting and uh, writing up of uh, uh, proposals, uh, uh, promotion documents, right. uh, memos, uh, the nitty gritty of, of run running a department. As assistant uh, dean of HSSC, I worked with a catalog, uh, new course entries and deletions, and getting the, cat the uh, undergraduate catalog in shape. I had some contact with the publications office uh, mm -hmm. in, in that job. And I also was an academic advisor. Uh, <clears throat> I did teaching for several years at the beginning of my career, but I gradually got out of that because I went into academic advising and then more and more into, the administ into administration. administration yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Um, when I went to the, uh, the graduate school, uh, I was my duties there were in fellowships, uh, scholarships and fellowships office, and, and was in charge of the Purdue fellowships. Uh, also, the research grants, uh, the XL and XR grants, they were called at that time for faculty, uh, research money for faculty. Um, 
and also some outside scholarships. Uh, for example, the the, the Rhodes, the, uh, right. the, the Churchill scholarships, right. the Marshall scholarships. Um, so a lot of um, requests for uh, research funds uh, that had to do with uh, the grants that professors have already won through the graduate school. For example, if they wanted to buy a microscope or something <laughs> and access some of the money that was available for that, if they needed it, it would come across my desk and uh, I would uh, consult with them and usually approve things like of that sort. Sometimes I had to turn it down, but uh, in, in that way I, got, I did get to know it was a wonderful place to get to know the whole yeah. university. I bet. All right. uh, and uh, the, the people, the marvelous people, <laughs> not just the department heads, but uh, the, the faculty that out there on the front line doing the research and the teaching. Uh, uh, when you say that and you think about today, that they've got the vice president for research and they've split that off. They split that off, yeah. I'm not quite sure how it's done now. <laughs> it's changed. Well, they, they just hired that new person, and yes. of course, the, the grad school is just uh, marked. They, from electrical and computer engineering has just taken that position. Mm -hmm. But it's, I did it's, read all, that. it's all different. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's two different it, things. Yeah, the structure has changed, uh, as they will over the years. Uh, were, you in sure they Excuse me, were you in Hawkins? Was that, it was built at that time, so that's where your office was, where the grad school is today? Yes, it, okay. was, it, was, uh, it was called Graduate House East. Right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> instead of... Instead of uh, they had not named it yet. No. Uh, but uh, yeah, they named the graduate houses later on. Uh, and now it's my been, office was in that. that now it's been changed to it's all offices now. I, I, yeah. I believe that's right. Yeah, I had right. forgotten so that. Made yeah. Some changes. Yeah. yeah. Well, did you stay there until you retired? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I don't have a the kind of career that I, I guess you would say is is ordinary in, in this respect. I was at Purdue for 24 years as an active faculty member. Uh, but I was kind of a victim of my own success, I think, uh, in, in doing the uh, kind of administrative work I was good at and, and was needed for. Uh, because although I enjoyed it and, and I, I felt fulfilled by it for a long, long time, as I approached middle age, uh, you know, that, that old uh, middle age crisis, you know, midlife crisis, <laughs> began to gnaw at me, and I actually became clinically depressed. Uh, um, this was early 1980s, particularly. It wasn't because I was overworked or anything. Uh, Fred Andrews retired about that time. Who took his uh, and it's Struther Arnott. Okay. Uh, and then did Ringo come after him? He came after okay. Struther. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Um, and Struther was a marvelous. Uh, <laughs> he's, a, he's a Nobel quality scientist, no question about that. He came from England. He or came no, from Scotland. 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 He, went, he went back to there. Yes. Um, yes. And I, I really treasure the time that I, I worked for him, too. But it was during his time there that I finally decided I simply could not do that job up to the standard that I wanted to do it and that, that he deserved to have. And he didn't overwork me or anything like that. I was, it was an internal thing. I just didn't feel I, I needed to do something else. Uh, well, I couldn't do anything. I, <laughs> I was, I was. You've been actually, doing that so long. Yeah, and and I was depressed. I mean, I was really couldn't. You know, anybody that suffered from depression knows you, it. Just it's paralyzing. You, I just every day was a drag to even get out of bed. So I requested medical leave, and Purdue came through. And I, I finally got on long-term disability, or long-term medical leave, mm -hmm. and uh, Phil Haas had to prove that he did. <laughs> Uh, so Purdue has always stayed by me, and uh, I consequently have stayed by Purdue. My contributions will never, <laughs> never fail, never falter. Let me ask you this. They did not have the halftime thing that they have now at that time, did they? At that time, they didn't, I no. Didn't. Uh, and I think that's a that good thing. It an might have been idea. a possibility, sure, yeah. Sure, right. But um, it took me about five years of, uh, of just kind of uh, <laughs> reconstructing my life. Yeah and really just resting and, and recovering from, from the depression. Uh, <clears throat> I still had music. I, I could play uh, play the trumpet in a little jazz band. I, sh I should get into that, maybe. That was one of the things that I... A local it, one? Yeah, the, the Cherry Lane Dudes. Uh, <laughs> this is... Uh, is it still? Do you still it's, still it's still going. Uh, one of my colleagues in foreign languages, in German, Harry Stout, played the trombone, and I played the trumpet, and we were both... We were at a party 
Uh, actually, it was a party sponsored by Christ Christian Keck, who eventually became an, a head of the Department of Foreign Language Department. Uh, <clears throat> at that time, she was a professor. And um, we were at her house at a party, and Harry and I were both there. And we got to talking about music and realized that we both played instruments. We both liked the same kind of music. The, the 30s, 40s, golden age, we call it, of big band swing music and uh, show tunes and romantic ballads and all that kind of thing. So, well, let's get together and practice. Let's play some things. We, we did, and we eventually lured... Just came about at the party. You didn't yeah, at the party, party, yeah. Sure. And he lived on Cherry Lane. I lived over in Lafayette. We played at each other's houses for a while, but we finally ended up just using Harry's house. That's why it's called the Cherry Lane Dudes, because he was closer to campus than Cherry Lane. <laughs> And we eventually recruited Ed Mertz, who's of high lysine corn fame. <laughs> his, his wife worked uh, in the library. Yeah, yes, she did, yeah. yeah. Um, so he, he was a first-class pianist, particularly jazz pianist, uh, improviser. And he, he knew the same method that I had learned in Indianapolis uh, before I did. <laughs> he was a, really, uh, a real pioneer on that. Uh, with the three of us... Uh, Got, got so yeah, we got so we could we could do pretty well. We eventually got other people. Uh, Dick Nelson uh, from the education department joined us fairly early on as a vocalist, and we, we recruited other people over the years. We were all almost all Purdue people at the beginning, but now we have people from. Uh, we have somebody that worked at uh, Caterpillar, Alcoa, and we have a couple of women now. We were all men at first, but <laughs> we have a vocalist, uh, Linda Michael, who was. Well, one time, my secretary in the foreign language department, she ended up as a secretary to the provost. Uh, so um, she had quite a career at Purdue, too. Sure. Uh, our piano player is a wife of an Alcoa retiree, Jean Dibel. So, uh, but we're still going strong. And, uh, where do you where do you do Well, we, we play at, uh, at, at the park uh, in Jenks Rest, Columbian Park, once a week. That's our regular venue there. That's our main gig. Over the years, we've gone out to a lot of nursing homes here, even in other cities. Uh, uh, we used That's to go nice. out a couple times a month uh, to the nursing home in the evening. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> the health of some of our members has deteriorated enough that we don't go out much in the evening. Once in a while, but not very often. Sure. So, but we still have the, the uh, Jenks rest on, on Friday afternoons, 1230 to 1.30. Uh, just after they're finishing up lunch, and uh, those that want to stay and listen, some go to another room and listen while they play cards. Others just leave. Is Jay's Press is it? Is it a social? It's a, it's, a, it's the senior center of Tippecanoe County. Oh, okay. It's under the auspices of the Area Four Council on Aging. All right. Okay. Yeah, and uh, th this has been. Uh, this was something that Harry Stout and I just off the top of our heads got started doing. We didn't think it would ever amount to anything, but it, it actually has. The, the people that listen to us enjoy it uh, because many times they don't have, they can't get out anyplace else. So this is something, and it's their kind of music, the older people's That's music. That's right. And, and, and uh, maybe even more important for the people doing it. Um, I we, would think so. We, we just record, re recruited <laughs> our drummer, uh, uh, Baudouin Van Gelder, uh, from Holland. Uh, is a Purdue professor. I mean, originally from Holland. He's now a uh, full-time resident or a permanent resident of the United States. Uh, <clears throat> he's a civil engineering professor at Purdue. But uh, he was looking for something just like this. He's an excellent, excellent drummer, and he didn't have a band, <laughs> particularly for the kind of music he wanted to do. Well, we <laughs> fit the bill, you know. So he's one of our best members, one of our <laughs> most loyal members now. But uh, all the people that, that do this, uh, it, it's just an outlet that they seem to need. So both for the band members, perhaps more so than even for the audience, sure. it's, it's been a very important it's thing. It's good for everybody. Yeah, and we've got, we, we get reward, uh, awards for this, for example. I was going to ask you about some awards and yeah. things. Well, oh, the, oh, nice. This, this was from the Tippecanoe County Counselors. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> a certificate of Appreciation, Board of Commissioners. Well, how nice. Uh, for the Cherry Lane Dudes. <clears throat> and this, sure. ha for the Senior Center of Tippecanoe County. That's what that plaque reads. Um, and I even I got a personal award uh, for having been a founder, along with Harry Stout, of the Trail Lane Dudes, along with some other volunteer work, which most of which I still do. I, I work uh, four hours a week at the Tippecanoe New County Library. I deliver bread for the Church Women United a couple times a month. Uh, 
I play the piano at a nursing home once a month. Uh, for a certain period of time? Yeah, uh -huh. uh, for a half hour little church service in the afternoon that they have there. I read to uh, nursing home residents a couple times uh, a, a week. Uh, you also played for some things here. Yes, you, yeah, so, yeah, from time to time. Place. That's right, that's right. I'm on the library committee here also in, in addition to that. Uh, but I had a, a little background of, uh, I also used to be a volunteer driver uh, for the uh, Volunteer Bureau, Lafayette Volunteer Bureau. So I've, I had a little variety there of, of community activity on a volunteer basis. So on the basis of that, I got the 2004 Community Service Excellence Award here uh, <laughs> in recognition of valuable contributions to the Cherry Lane dudes, but it, it was, very nice. It was a combination of things. Were you a little bit surprised when you got that? I was, yes. Yeah. Uh, I always ask people, sometimes they're surprised. <laughs> it's not, sometimes, well, I'm not real sure, but I sort of sense something might be coming. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. Uh, and I, my, my actual reaction to it was, I don't deserve this nearly as much as, I could name you 20 people. <laughs> that well, we wanted it. you to have <laughs> but, but I don't. On behalf of the others. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I have to look at it that way. <laughs> Well, I think you covered because I was going to ask you what you're doing in your retirement. What about family of wife, and do you have any children? Yes, we have two children. Okay. Uh, Barbara, the younger one, lives here in town. Uh, she uh, has two, actually three degrees from Purdue. Two, un two uh, she has an associate degree and a, a graduate, or a, an undergraduate bachelor's degree in uh, RHI. Actually, mm -hmm. it's called hospitality management or something. Or yeah, is, tourism. Yeah. yeah. And then she went back to school later and got a, another bachelor's degree, Bachelor of Arts in Fine Arts. So she's a freelance artist, uh, painting and, uh, and jewelry, um, and also works half-time at uh, Indiana Design Consortium in, mm -hmm. in Lafayette, mm -hmm. uh, our advertising sure. work. Our older daughter, Mary Ann, uh, got a Ph.D. in Religious Studies at Vanderbilt and works in Nashville for Abingdon Press as a as a senior editor. She's an editor for all their reference works, uh, which is quite a big, big job. Oh, I bet. <clears throat> so, and, and we have, uh, she has two children, uh, a boy and a girl. They're both in college now. Uh, and Barbara has one daughter who also is now married, and we have a great grandson. <laughs> so, <laughs> quite the a family is growing. W wonderful family. Yes. Yes, yes that's right. Yeah. Um, so, the, the awards that I've gotten, I Those guess, are, are very nice. They yeah. happen to come though uh, <laughs> for community rather than Purdue, exactly. But uh, Purdue They're was still right. was still at the at the center. Did they have everything. Did they have a retirement event for you at all when you retired? Or? Yes, oh. yes, uh, they they did. Um, it, it was at um, the the Oaks downtown. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry, joke. Yeah, sorry, sorry, joke. That was right. it. Yeah, yeah. sorry, joke. And Mel Brutzman was the. Uh, the, the, the owner manager of that restaurant. He's now uh, manager here of food services at the University of Place. So that was a nice touch. Yeah, we had a wonderful banquet. Uh, Crystal Keck was the department head at that time. Uh, it was 1999 when I finally officially re sure. re retired. Um, and by, by that time, I had um, recovered from my depression. And um, let, let, let it be known for those who, who might have any kind of similar experience that. There is life after retirement, even if, if your, your retirement is kind of early retirement, as mine was. Uh, I, I was able to, to regroup uh, with Purdue's support and with the support of my family and uh, with the support of the Almighty, I would say. <laughs> uh, all those worked together. All, all of those worked together. Sure. And I finally discovered with... with my piano playing, with my trumpet playing. Uh, I was never anyways near a professional level performer in, in those areas, not even hardly semi-professional, well, maybe close at some time, but not, not really. Uh, to my satisfaction at all, I knew I was a better musician than I could, I could perform. Well, there must be some way I could get this music out of me. Well, lo and behold, um, I had bought a little book on improvising chorus structures and, oh, maybe back when you know, I was about 30 years old. I, I also took classical piano lessons when I was 30 years old, but I could, I could say I wasn't ever going to be a concert pianist. 
but I've dug this little book out back in 1990 and uh, went through it again just to see what was there and I ran across pages on writing songs and it was just the bare minimum, just a page or two. But I thought, gee, you know, I never tried that. I don't. I didn't think I ever could do anything like that. But it made it sound like anybody could do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, okay, you know, I'll put it tomorrow. You know, <laughs> as I'm at least likely to do, put things off until the next day. It doesn't work that way with a creative spirit. <laughs> just the notion, just the idea that I was going to try that. I began to get a song immediately, almost immediately, that same day, that same afternoon. And I, part of it is how things work together. If anybody's in the creative area out there, you, you know this probably, but uh, little things that have come along in your life, uh, they stay in your brain some way and subconsciously, whether you realize it or not. Well, I had heard, I knew that there were lots of songs named after girls, you know, uh, but there was never one that we could find that was named after my wife's name, Janet. So I immediately, I could write a song about Janet. <laughs> so that was what I started. I got the words and music by that evening. And the next day I wrote it up. I was hooked from that time on. I could see it, how it worked. It, you, it's not something, it's not like sitting down and writing a memo, which I was used to. You organize your thoughts and you do it. It's a very left brain kind of thing. But the, any kind of artistic music production that, that was going is, is a right right brain to start with. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. Well, it came from my right brain. <laughs> and since then, I, uh, I started out with some popular music, uh, uh, kind of that style of music sure. uh, writing. Uh, I very quickly got into choral music and more advanced, more, more sophisticated, more complex music, four-part choir music with accompaniments and even with uh, obligato instruments. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I started out writing everything on, by hand, by manuscript. That was this was before there were really available, uh, viable uh, computer-assisted notation programs. So I learned how to do that, and I, that was my own copyist. <laughs> the old, the master composers used to scribble out their stuff and have a professional copyist decipher it and write out legible uh, scores. But I, I was able to do it very painstakingly uh, for four-part choir. <clears throat> And uh, my church choir began to perform these, and they were successful. What and church is this at? First Christian Church. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. And uh, so this, eventually, as computer notation became more prevalent, I bought into that with Finale, the premier program at that time, and became proficient at that. And uh, I never looked back from that. And I've uh, <coughs> the other. Uh, Part of my life, this last part, is, has been very rewarding in that respect, and it is tied in with, with Purdue. Uh, sure. Um, the, uh, for, for example, I, one of the pieces, most of my pieces are uh, for church choirs uh, with a religious theme, but one piece I wrote fairly early on was the, the setting for the Pledge of Allegiance, which came to me as an idea that might make sense. Uh, usually I write my own words and set it to music. The music comes to me first, and I put the words with it, or it comes almost simultaneously together. But sometimes I work with a already existing text, and in this case, I did with the Pledge of Allegiance, and, and put music to it, and it seemed like a pretty good thing to me. And it, our church actually performed it, and it, it worked well. Uh, but I wasn't able to to do much else with it until uh, the all campus chorale with the PMO got started. And it seemed to me that was a good good way. They might be interested in doing this. It would, it would fit. Sure enough, uh, uh, Brian Breed was the director at that. And he, he authorized uh, them to, to use this at one of their spring concerts. It was 2005. So they did this uh, piece, Pledge of Allegiance, uh, my setting uh, at their spring concert. And on the basis of that, uh, I was able to pitch this or uh, sell it, you might say, to uh, the people that do the Stars and Stripes program, uh, Dick Yeager and, and Bill Kissinger. The July 4th thing? The July 4th uh, Stars and Stripes concert at Slater Center. And uh, probably the you were going to ask me about uh, a highlight of my... <laughs> Go for it. Okay. This, is it. this would probably have to be it, where everything came together. Uh, Sure. Uh, Bill Kissinger kindly uh, 
wrote a band arrangement of the, my piano accompaniment uh, for uh, the choral setting. And uh, his citizens band, Lafayette citizens band, after he re he had retired by that time too, that was uh, his first year out of re retirement. Um, he <coughs> made this arrangement and then directed the citizens band with the Lafayette Freedom Singers, which only gets together once a year <laughs> for this very purpose. That uh, choral singers from all over the all over the Lafayette area for this fun get together and to sing this concert. So we sang my piece at that concert, <coughs> and uh, it was it combined Purdue uh, with, with the band department. It combined PIO, PMO was involved in it uh, certainly from getting the piece first audition. Um, the Lafayette community generally. <laughs> My family was all there. <laughs> what? How, how can you beat that? <laughs> Sounds good to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I have a recording of it. And, uh, That's nice. Also, uh, I have a recording of uh, five of my anthems that were uh, another Purdue connection. Uh, Clayton Lean, a professor of English and also, I think, head of the honors program in liberal arts now, uh, has a it's almost professional, I mean they could be professional, group of singers called the Lafayette Chamber Singers. Uh, they're on, a par, yeah, you know, nice they're on a par with the Lafayette Symphony and, and the, the Bach Chorale. And they give concerts every year. Oh, they're just an excellent group and uh, Clayton agreed and the singers agreed to make a demonstration CD of five of my anthems. So they're also available. Um, but it, they did a marvelous job with them and on the basis of that demonstration. Uh, two of them now have been published. Uh, it's an online publisher, DemoQ Music, uh, and they, uh, they've sold somewhat, but online publishing of choral music just has not taken off and may never because uh, <clears throat> the choir directors like to go to workshops where the music is passed out and they get to look at it and sing it right there and, and then they buy that. <laughs> they don't usually get it on, even though you can listen to this online and see the score and everything, uh, they don't like they to like buy the it that way. Yeah, they have. Also, in this, with this publisher, you have to download a master copy and then make copies. And, you know, well, it's, it's not as convenient sometimes as they, they might want, but, sure. uh, but anyway, it was a good idea. <laughs> it's worth, it's, and, and it's worth it's, exploring. It's, it's worth right. exploring. But on the basis of that, one thing that the internet has done. Um, it was posted on the internet and of course available all over the world. Well, there's a choir director in Italy that found one of my pieces from this publisher and actually emailed me before he even contacted the publisher and say, I, I like this. In fact, it was kind of a broken English, you know, bravo, I'd like music. Where can I find more about? Or something. <laughs> I got an email. Even it, it just hadn't been up more than a day or two. He just—it was just one of these coincidental, lucky things. Instant success. Yeah, yeah. So lo and behold, he uh, ordered it, and he has performed it several times. With, he has a wonderful choir in Italy. Of course, Italy is the land of music, anyway. And, and uh, he has—he's a, a wonderful choir, a, a community choir. He sends me pictures of it, pictures of his family. He sends me the programs for when he does. Uh, <laughs> we're still in touch. Yeah. Uh, That's nice. And he liked it enough that he's not only performed it several times, but he had the, my words translated into Italian, and he's performed it in Italian. He sent me the words for that, and a little preamble he gave to one of the concerts telling about the piece there. I, I couldn't ask. Maybe, maybe that's another highlight. <laughs> you got quite a few. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, do you have a um, favorite Purdue tradition that uh, comes to your mind? Tradition that you think about? Purdue tradition. Well, uh, Back in my day, it was senior chords. <laughs> senior chords and canes and mustaches <laughs> to, to the first football Very game. Very traditional. we got an yeah. exhibit going on at this time with the chords, and, and uh, uh -huh. yeah, they're really, it, it's, it, it meant yeah. a lot. Yeah. In fact, we've even gotten a couple, that one is on display in our exhibit case, so one of our alums or a donor yeah. gave it to us. Yeah. There's yeah. Ho Hello Walk, of course. Yeah. There's the Lions out, out the standing corner hall. And they finally resurrected and brought it back. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. now it actually forever. works again. Yes, yeah. it does. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and, of course, the bell the tower, the one brick higher, the, all of that business. is. Uh, it's amazing what the, of course, a lot of others have also mentioned the smokestack, but that, of course, is gone, and now the, yeah. the, yeah. the bell tower 
when you come in or at night or things that really sets the, yes, sets yeah, it off. It's, yeah. it's a really nice, unique thing yeah. for the community. And they they preserved uh, the old Hevelin Hall um, architectural style with that. Right, exactly. And, and, uh, That's right. Any so, uh, closing? Any? I think you've really covered just about really, and you just keep busy, which is really great. I, I do, and uh, this university place is perfect for that. Right. <laughs> yes. So, and um, you've lived in the community a long time, and you're not too far from where you were raised. That's so right. There's nice. we have our own bus takes us to all the Purdue events that we want to go to, right. and a lot of good Purdue faculty live here. Plus, lots of other people from all other walks of life, which is important too. That's I right. think. Uh, I know living over in, in Lafayette, I got to meet a lot of people uh, <clears throat> other than the university. So uh, I think that's helped expand my horizons a lot. I lived in Spain also with my wife and two, our children were only three and six at the time. I was a director of our foreign study program. Uh, it was the second year, in fact, the first year of the program where three universities uh, um, actually uh, cooperated on it, University of Wisconsin, Indiana University in Purdue. Uh, <clears throat> we started uh, a program in Madrid, Spain. It was the very first program that foreign study program Purdue had, the first year abroad program. And the, the one, the first year, very first year, Purdue was the only participant. Again, Don Walther got this going. The second year, with all three universities, I was the director. And uh, our little family, we all went over there and spent a year <laughs> in Madrid. Our oldest daughter was a first grader, and she went to the Air Force School in, in Madrid, and she could learn in English. Uh, but uh, it was a good experience for me, of course, to perfect Spanish, and my wife Janet also picked up quite a bit of Spanish there. Prado. Oh, yes, the Prado. Oh, yes. In fact, the courses that our students, we had, I think, uh, not quite 30 students, uh, they the, the uh, University of Madrid, which cooperated with us on this, of course, uh, set up special courses for us with, with their outstanding professors uh, and art historians. That a, a whole course on the Prado, where they went there every day and studied the paintings. How lucky! Wasn't that something? Yeah, yeah. How lucky. Yes. Did you? Were you the director for the three schools? The three schools. They just had one director, and you took it. So they had students from all. Three. All three universities. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and we was, was for a whole year. For a whole year, yeah, from uh, September through June, mm -hmm. the whole academic year, and they lived with families. That's one of the things the director had to do was uh, well, scout you, around did, and find. Did you have to? Did you live with a family, or you had your own place? No, we had our own place. Okay. We had a, an apartment. Um, it was across the street, actually, from uh, one of the Purdue professors, uh, who had been a Fulbright scholar. He was a Spanish. Native, na na uh, national, <laughs> and uh, had been to Un United States on a Fulbright, and had to go back to Spain for at least a year because uh, Purdue wanted to keep him as a professor. <laughs> so he had to come back. The, the go rules, back yeah. He was Juan Luis Alborg, was his name, uh, <clears throat> and he and his wife lived in a part of Madrid that was a nice residential area. And he found this apartment for us because that was the year he happened to be there. Uh, so uh, that was that make it very nice. Very nice, yeah. And uh, I had a, a, a Spanish man about my age who uh, became the program assistant or secretary, uh, who helped me go out and find housing for the students. Interviewing. You had to take care of that. We had to take care of that. Yeah, wow. yeah. That that was the first year. It was harder than usual because we <laughs> after that they tended to keep the same ones <laughs> but we found you enough to make, you had to make ground yeah, there <laughs> yeah, we found enough the students at that time went over on a ship called the Aurelia <laughs> and, did you guys uh, go on the ship too? no we flew uh, TWA <laughs> called it La Tua <laughs> in, in Spanish uh, but uh, they went on on ship and then we they went by rail then to Paris and the directors eventually we had programs in Strasbourg and uh, Hamburg, Strasbourg, France, Hamburg, uh, Germany, as well as Madrid, Spain. Uh, and, and then they would all converge at Paris, and the directors would meet them there, and then would, they would go to their... But the, the ship always docked at Le Havre in, in France, and then the students would go to Paris, and the directors would come there and take them by train, usually, to... Uh, where they were supposed to go. Where they were supposed to go. In, in, in the case of Spain, uh, there's a different gauge railroad between <laughs> France and Spain at that time, at least. So we had to switch trains on the border, but we got there. <laughs> <laughs>
just added to it, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Oh. We knew we were someplace, <laughs> someplace else. <laughs> oh. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Blickenstein. This has been very, very nice. You really have a lot that, to share that a researcher can really benefit by. Oh, thank I, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.